Thank you for coming to this celebration of student work. I'm delighted by what my students have discovered and I'm thankful they're here to share it with you. Their assignment was to choose a field site, a community, and spend at least four hours observing it and taking field notes. They then pulled out themes and did research focused on similar sites or related topics. Finally, they wrote everything up, including an analysis of their findings. This could include a discussion of implications, policy recommendations, or an understanding they now hold. And I hope you enjoy their stories of process and discovery. Feel free to drop questions and comments in the chat, and we will return to them in the Q&A at the end. Shall we get started? We'll be hearing first from Jose Ambriz. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Jose Ambriz. I'm in Miss Wendy's with Miss Wendy Smith's Wednesday class, English 101 X. Uh, this is my my English class, my first English class since 2003. I've been um, I had restarted college back back in to 2020 when the pandemic started so when we were all stuck at home i decided to go back to college and pursue an engineering degree but as i've been taking courses and especially this course i sort of had a maybe a change of mind or a change of heart that and and maybe start trying to pursue more of a management major but I think the my plan is to keep on going to school, taking one class at a time, getting getting finishing my general ed. But a little bit about myself, I like I said, I just restarted college. And this is my first time taking my English class, an English class since two thousand three. I recently moved to San Marcos, and that's where we're where where I decided to to sort of start my research and if I can share my screen I decided to do if can if every can does everyone see my screen yes we can thank you Jose oh okay so my my ethnography paper was uh, named late night soccer which is actually my favorite sport and my field site was actually the Escondido Sportsplex or the Escondido Sports Center. Hopefully the, the picture will pop up right now. It did pop up. There it goes. I need to do one more click. So this is the Escondido Sports Center. It's right behind the Escondido Mall. And the Escondido Sports Center is where I come and play pickup soccer on the weekends with um, with my brother-in-law and his group of friends. As you can see here, uh, there's a really big indoor soccer field, and this there's a small indoor soccer field, and and I'm just describing those because um, there's one one story I like to tell when when I was at the at the site. But the Escondido Sports Center is great. It has a, a skate park, it has two roller rinks, and it has obviously uh, two indoor soccer fields. And there's, it's a great place to, to go use your scooter. They hold lots of events. There's, there's roller skating sessions, as you can see here. I'm almost advertising the place that you guys can visit if you guys are ever in Escondido. And there's also roller rink and there's adult hockey leagues and young young hockey leagues and there's adult soccer leagues and children's soccer leagues there too and the sports center where i decided to to do my research was the field site but the 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 people who i concentrated were a group of fans so can people can people see my my mouse can you guys see my mouse where i'm pointing so this right here the guy in the center right here this is my brother-in-law saul he's the only person that i knew when I first moved to San Marcos. And this is a, these are a group of his friends. This is, they're barely getting started. They're jumping onto the indoor soccer field. 
right here they're they're talking before anything they 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 talk to each other they 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 joke around they they ask themselves hey how's it going and i made all these observations with the with the three field notes that miss wendy asked us to to fill out so and and i and i'll keep on sharing more of the of the of the pictures i took that that first night so the the very first slide you saw the the group there it was a group of married men and then on this slide slide are younger teenagers that also go to play to play soccer so there's there's a text message that Saul sends out that Saul sends out every Saturday and inviting everyone to come out and play soccer and that's where I was invited to come play and instead of actually playing that night I actually uh, sat here. I don't know if you can see where he's sitting. That's not me sitting there, but I would sit there and I would and I started absorbing everything that I saw. And when I was when I was there, I noticed I I started noticing many things and I started narrating, sort of like a, a an, in a soccer match, narrating the back and forth action and all the all the all the screams and all the yelling that they were screaming. And it's always everyone screaming goal or everyone screaming in Spanish, pasala, pasala, or watch out, watch out, they llegan. And, and it, was, it was a very, very um, in, intense game every time I went. And, one, and two of the times would happen when I went to the, to the field site, two of the times that I went, there was double, bu double booking. And I don't know if you if you remember how I, I I showed at the beginning of the of the slide, where there was two two soccer fields. One was one was the big soccer field, whereas where they where they usually play in the smaller soccer field. The first night it was double booked, and there were some people already playing there. And then um, there was a small discussion, but it went amicable, and the team that the people who were already there left to the smaller field. And nothing really else happened. But the second, the third night, um, actually, the, the this there was a game going on here, and there was people already playing here. But their time had already passed, and they didn't want to leave. And there was a bit of bit of a confrontation because they 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 weren't they weren't ready to leave the field that they want, and they thought they had rented the field for longer. And we had to get they had to get staff involved just to have them escorted or removed off the field. But it, it, it led me to much other observations. One of, one of those observations is that there's a not, not a lot of places where you can go play pickup games. And this is one of the few places you could play pickup games. So there's a lot of need for them. And, and if there is a public park where you can go play a pickup game and you see a group of Latino males playing, it probably draws attention depending on where you're at. If it's a nice neighborhood, it draws attention and maybe it's cause for concern and they'll call the authorities and, and ask them, hey, do you have permission to be here? And that's, that's one thing that, that led to my research. Another thing that I, that, and most importantly, what I found was, was found is that, that there was social ties being made with this group of friends that as you can see here, when they were, they would stand in the circle, they would also do this at the end of the games. They would stand in, in a group of circle and I would listen in and they would just joke around with each other. And, and then, then they would um, actually talk about their jobs, talk about their families, and they all, they all know each other. And they decided to, to actually invite me to one of their child's birthday party. And I also took that in my field notes. And what I've noticed is that they're the, the married men are the ones who are the, the closest together. And they, they, they created this, this social connect, these social ties, and, and they help each other out. And, and I want to read this quote that Miss, that Miss Wendy shared with me about, about social capital, because I couldn't find the words, and I'm still finding it hard to find the exact words to describe what I'm saying. But this bonding that they have where they all have these, these trade jobs where one's a mechanic, one's a plumber, another's an electrician, they all help each other out. So if someone has a, a car problem, they turn to their mechanic friend. If someone has a plumbing problem at their house, they call the plumber to help them out. And they, they have this, 
the social capital that that they that they were able to they that they able they, they're able to 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 have and i want to read this quote that Ms. wendy shared with me it says i do not refer to real estate or to personal property or to cold cash but rather to the life which tends to make these tangible substance count for the most in the daily lives of people, namely goodwill, fellowship, mutual sympathy, and social intercourse among a group of individuals and families who make up the social unit. If he may come into contact with his neighbor and they, and they with other neighbors, there will be accumulation of social capital, which may immediately satisfy social needs and which may bear a social potential, potentiality sufficient to substantial improvement of living conditions in the whole community. The community as a whole will benefit by the cooperation of all its parts, while the individuals will find its, in his association the advantages of the help, the sympathy, and the fellowship of his neighbors. And that's what I found is that they, 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 were, they were connected and they, were, they bonded each other through this what initiated as a pickup game led led to a lot of more important social ties and social connection in their communities where they invite each other to each other's uh, children's birthday party. They help each other with with their with their knowledge in their profession, and they 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 help each other, and they have this social capital, this social worth that being a lot of them being new to this country they don't have those connections but are actually making these connections starting that which all starts from from a from a pickup game they the for that love of soccer and so at first playing soccer is, is an excuse to get together get exercise and have fun but what makes you keep on coming is that friendship that they built together at at, at playing these late night pickup games and, and the last thing I want to share is the my the last paragraph of my conclusion. It's not a not a strong conclusion, but if I can read it, this goes beyond trying to have fun and play soccer. The social connections that are made have evolved into lifetime friendships with strong bonds of trust that have helped with their everyday life. It's not until one takes a closer look at what's going on that one comes to find out that there's a community of friends and family behind the pickup game. Although I found David Troyo's dissertation, there is not much research on the connection between Latinos playing pickup soccer and social ties. Nevertheless, in only three days of observation, I come to find out that there is more to these late night games. And that, that's the most important thing that I took out of it, that, that there is these social ties and that there is these special friendships that were made through the, through the pickup games. Um, at the end of everything with my research, which was, which I want, wanted to say, I haven't had a class since, since 2003, and this is my first English class. What I learned is that Ms. Wendy made, made this last paper or final paper real easy because we had three day, three, three field notes that we all, that we filled out and we had a research and response paper that we had to do. So with all that information that I, all that work that I did before made this final paper real easy to, to write, which I was, to my surprise, wrote, I think almost like 12 to, to 13 pages, which I've never written in my life, which is a lot. But Ms. Wendy made, made it that much easier because we had the notes and we had the, the research paper and all we had to do is just start building it together with like Legos and it, and it came. And it's not a perfect paper, but but it, it it's something that I'm I'm happy with and I can say proud of because I've never written a paper this long before. But I like to thank everyone for for listening to me and and taking the time out of your your schedules and hopefully you learned something from from what I said. But if we like to, I would like to now hand the mic over or give a turn to another student, um, Shana. She's okay. Thank you, everyone. Hi, thank you, Jose. And I don't know if you <laughs> or saw me waving at somebody. Of course, our security just walked in, <laughs> but he's left just in time. Um, okay, so I didn't have anything as beautiful as this, but um, 
my name is Shauna. Um, my, uh, I'm basically pursuing a radio career. I'm not exactly sure if I'm pursuing a degree just yet. I'm still kind of figuring that part out. Um, but this class was an advisory for one of my classes. And, you know, I thought it was a good opportunity since I wanted to take English classes and kind of expand, you know, my knowledge, my vocabulary, my writing skills. And, um, and I, I, you know, think this class really helped with that. So um, I'll just jump right into it. So basically, when we were deciding to um, pick a field site, I was on initially thinking downtown because that's where I live and I live around, you know, a whole area. I live in East Village. So that's the place that's known for, um, you know, homeless and everything that goes on out here. But as I thought about it, I realized it probably wasn't a, the safest idea being by myself out there and kind of observing. So I thought about um, other areas and remember that Ocean Beach um, or OB is has an area that maybe some of you know that area. It's the seawall area that's right that it's right next to the pier. And um, I think just like over the last maybe closer, maybe before COVID, it was a little bit worse, but it was really crowded with people. And, um, you know, people were partying, playing music, drinking, smoking. And I don't know if it really bothered me when I was younger, or I just didn't notice it. But as I got older, I'd walk by and it was just smelled disgusting. And I just, I hated it. And at some point, I'm like, what, why are, they, are these people here? Like, why this wall? And then that, you know, dawned on me when I was thinking of some, I'm like, you know, those people are still there. So why don't I figure it out? Um, it was a little bit harder than I <laughs> expected, but because I, as I observed, I was, you know, by myself the first couple of times and I have so much social anxiety. So walking around by myself and, you know, thinking about walking up to these people was just out of question. But I, you know, at least I looked at everything around me and observed what was going on around me. I saw lots of interesting characters and I, you know, over the next couple of visits, they were still there. Um, and I was still kind of getting surface information. So I ended up, um, well, I ended up having a lot of information just with that and research just looks like with, um, you know, the news and what the community was fighting about, you know, regarding the homeless or regarding vendors or even just other things like city, you know, uh, fences that were neighbors were getting, you know, uh, uh, going against city code and the, all those kind of like board issues that were bringing about, brought about, but even that was like still too surface for me. And I ended up finally reaching out to a group on Facebook, um, part of who, you know, they're just part of an OB community who they're just like neighborhood watch type of people. And when I asked, it blew up more than I wanted. <laughs> Some people were angry yeah, that I wasn't asking these people myself. They were coming after me. And then other people were, you know, supportive of me and, um, you know, responded to me with lots of detail. And then others were just giving me their full opinions of how they felt as residents with the situation. And I almost wanted to just like cut it off, cut off comments completely and cut off messages. I'm like, okay, this is a lot. But one person actually um, connected me to a homeless person, a homeless veteran. And he gave me a lot of information about, you know, the homeless and how they, um, they're not all homeless. Some are travelers, some are people that just come from the outside and just, um, uh, you know, they'll, they come out here and they bother people. They commit crimes or they beg for money. And then people like this man, he says that they don't uh, condone that kind of behavior. They don't, they're not for that. And there's, there's separate groups of people that are homeless out there and that the, his group, they like to keep, keep OB clean and they're, you know, in support of what the residents want and they don't trash it. They don't do drugs out there. They don't drink. They respect the law enforcement and law enforcement doesn't bother them. So it's really interesting to see how, um, how much is going on with just them. <laughs> and then we have the vendors, which is, I think is another big thing with San Diego right now with vendors blocking the beaches and blocking the streets. So that was another issue that I caught on, um, 
but I don't think it was as bad as it is everywhere else when I was there. Um, and then there was, uh, say I went to vendors and then the, um, I'm blanking, the, well, the wall, the wall was the, one of the things. So there's travelers that there's some that in their that are in their vans that live in their vans and there's um others that just um come out they live other places but they come to ob just to be in ob sometimes they'll be homeless somewhere else and they will travel out here or people will travel from apparently up north where it's colder and they come out here um, but that's what that, that homeless veteran told me that was, he calls them transients. <laughs> that's it. That was his word for them the whole time. He kept calling them transients. Um, uh, but I, it was kind of hard to tell, like, I didn't talk to anybody that was at the wall. That was like the only thing that I didn't succeed in doing, but I was happy. I got information from him because he knew some of them. And then he said that there's people that he just stays away from and doesn't talk to, um, and then I, I noticed a few other things like in research, like the um, drum circle, stuff like that. But it, I think I had such an abundance of information about Ocean Beach that I did not expect to find by looking at the wall <laughs> that I kind of just had to cut that part off. So it was it was really a, quite the experience. It was very overwhelming because for a small town, it had a lot going on, <laughs> but it was worth it and now I know more about my city and now when I go there I will have a different perspective and I'll you know I'll keep an eye out for <laughs> these people who are the regulars and um you know just they love their community just as much as everybody else um so thank you for listening and I will pass it on to Stephanie Hi everyone, I'm Stephanie. Um, I am a wife and mother of two kids, a five-year-old and a three-year-old. Um, this is my first semester at Mesa. I have not been in school for 13 years. So this was very a lot for me, um, but this has been a really good class. I'm taking three classes right now and I work in real estate part-time. Um, I picked to do my project on flight attendants. My brother is a flight attendant and him and I are best friends. Um, I know all of his friends and he really surrounds himself with other people in the, the flight industry. So I felt like I had a really big group of people that I could interview and uh, do this project on. I had another project in a different class, my child development class, where I had to observe people and I was met with a lot of resistance. So this was, um, this was, I, I picked more of a safe, a safe group, people that I knew would, um, you know, give me a lot of good information. So I, I interviewed my brother first. He gave me my, uh, my basis of who I was, of flight attendants. So um, I had a really lengthy interview with him and I went into his system, uh, his scheduling system, and we, I got to learn all about his schedule, how they bid for their time off, um, which I didn't realize was going to be such a big part of my paper was their scheduling. So I learned a lot about that. And I got just a really good base for my paper from that first interview with him. And then I conducted two more interviews. I did the double entry note taking that uh, we were taught in class and it was really beneficial for me. I wrote down all of my interview questions on the left and then on the right were my responses. My third interview with him was strictly just the pros and cons of our, of, of his industry. And then uh, my, then I, I interviewed four flight attendants. So he was my first one. And then I interviewed three other and I just got a general interview with them, got to know more who they were, 
um, the basis of who they are and what's important to them in their field. And then I traveled from, um, they are a Las Vegas based flight crew. So uh, they all live in Las Vegas. They don't, they're not all from Las Vegas. One man is from Puerto Rico, one's from Los Angeles. The other two are Las Vegas, but my family and I went to Las Vegas for Thanksgiving and spent time at my brother's house. And um, we drove, we didn't fly. We didn't get to use his buddy passes that he has because there was just, that would mean I would use eight with my family of four and it's flying standby. So it's just a lot. Um, so we drove to Vegas and what was nice was that everyone that I was interviewing was going to be there. So we all hung out in the morning uh, while making food. And then on our downtime, I finished out all of my interviews with them in person, which was really nice. Um, a lot of them are, like I said, not from Vegas. So they don't have family in Las Vegas. They're just really, they made a, a family out of all of their friends that they work with and they really have to lean on each other for that friendship. Um, so I did all my interviews with them and what was really cool was he invited, there was a gate agent there, two other pilots a couple other flight attendants on top of the flight attendants that I was already interviewing. And they were all there for Thanksgiving just to be a part of it because, you know, they're not from Vegas. One guy, for example, a pilot that I didn't interview, he is based in San Francisco. So he has to commute from Las Vegas to San Francisco for his, you know, three, four day trips at a time. So being a flight attendant, you really do have to lean on your flight attendant community um, for things like holidays too. So we had a lot of people there at Thanksgiving from the industry. And I was like an ethnographic heaven. I was listening to them all talk. I wasn't even doing my interviews, but they just could not help themselves talk about their job. And they have such interesting lives. My work in real estate, it's it's not that interesting. I wouldn't talk about it in the big group. It just isn't that interesting. I don't encounter that many fun people, <laughs> colorful people like they do. So it was really cool listening to them. And I got a lot of information, a lot of research from my double entry note taking. And then from that point, I had to write my paper. And what I did was I um, read a lot of the examples that were given to us in class, and I found a format that I thought kind of would work with my paper. Um, and what I found was that I, I gave myself three different formats to kind of work with once I wrote my paper. And I wasn't sure if I was going to make my paper about my first uh, format was going to be like uh, the group, a little bit about each person and maybe just write the pros and cons. But I found I couldn't make my paper about the pros and cons because for one person, COVID was a big con. For the other, it was a pro because three of the flight attendants, they were all um, um, very senior, th uh, 11 years in the industry. COVID, they got to be on leave and paid and it was just great for them. So I found I couldn't do a pro and con paper. Um, I wasn't sure if I, I picked out themes from my interviews and I wasn't sure if I was going to make mine about, you know, just generally the people that I interviewed and then write bullet points, a section of maybe boarding, uh, flight security, COVID, like that. But what I ended up doing was I made each person a section. For example, my brother, the first person I interviewed, he talked a lot about flight security. So his section was, every person's section was about their schedule because that's big. So it was about his schedule and uh, flight security. The next person was his schedule and um, his traveling. Uh, the next person, she was pregnant. So hers was about her schedule pregnancy and she gave me really good information about boarding. 
Um, the last one was her schedule being on reserve, which was very unique to the others um, and COVID. So I made each section and that's kind of what I did. I, I even thought I could write my paper on flight attendants and COVID, like I said before, but it just didn't work out that way. I, I didn't, I wasn't able to do it on pros and cons, but I just had so much information and I picked themes that I thought were important and, and I wrote my paper. So it kind of wrote itself too with the double entry note taking. I found once I looked at all my research, things I would write from my responses, I was able to use in my paper. Um, so yeah, it was, it was fun actually. I learned a lot and I felt lucky that I picked a group of people that were so eager to give me information um, and it made it easy. So yeah, thank you guys um, for listening <laughs> and your time. Next we have Husna. All right, so hello everyone, good evening. I hope you all are doing well and you are safe and sound. My name is Husna and my last name is Ayubi. I am originally from Afghanistan. I came here last year in August. And um, this is my first semester at Mesa and I had the pleasure to take the class with uh, Professor Wendy and Professor Catlin. It was a really good semester and I get, got to learn um, a lot apart from academics uh, in general, I got to, uh, uh, it, it helped me grow as a person. Uh, so about my site, um, I choose uh, my site uh, as the place that I work in. Actually, I chose the place that I'm working as my site. Uh, it was Montgomery Middle School, uh, the newcomer class uh, where I work as a bilingual language development assistant. Uh, the main goal of my paper initially was to focus on the challenges that students have. However, as I uh, did my observations, I noticed that the teachers, they also face a lot of problems and they struggle to deliver very high quality education. So I thought that um, it, I should also include the struggles that the teachers have. Uh, the reason why I chose um, Montgomery Middle School's newcomer class as my field site was that first of all it was accessible to me I could I was going there already and I did not interfere with my schedule for my classes or my work time and secondly uh, it was interesting for me I wanted to see how a school looks like from the students perspective and especially the students who are refugees and who came new to the US. This class of Montgomery, uh, Montgomery School's newcomers class, it consists of students from Afghanistan, students from Mexico, Syria, and uh, there is one student from Russia as well. So we pretty have a diverse class in there. And it was interesting for me to talk with them, observe them as they were doing their work. Uh, I observed my class for more than four hours because I was there and I had the privilege to spend longer time there. Uh, I observed as a third person sometimes and sometimes I interviewed the students. Uh, the very first challenge that I noticed they were facing was the language barrier. Uh, as it is obvious for them, they're all language learners right now, and they struggle to understand, they struggle to communicate. It is hard for them to understand what the teacher is trying to imply, and they also have trouble in expressing themselves. Uh, the reaction of them that I noticed almost all of them were doing was that they only copied the notes that the teacher provided them, and they some of them did not even attempt to understand what the notes were saying, but they rather just copied. And then um, other than that, uh, they, were, well, they had problems navigating through the system. It was hard for them to adapt quickly because uh, in their home countries, they usually use different systems. Most of them do not have access to technology and they um, their classes are more teacher-centered rather than student-centered or using even technology. So it is hard for them 
Um, I saw most of them who were struggling with using computers and they, during their studies, they just came to the teacher and, inter and interrupted her just for asking, how can I do this on my Chromebook or how can I do that? And um, uh, the language barrier also uh, makes school boring for them because they cannot make, they cannot make friends easily. Uh, I saw most of the students who were just sitting quietly during their races or they just walked out of the class and came back and they were just quiet. They did not interact with other students, which um, in my opinion, it is because of um, not being able to communicate. And also when I asked them during my interviews, they said that they do not have as many friends as they had back in home. Um, the uh, next problem that um, I understood that students are facing uh, was that uh, the struggles that they are facing uh, in their academics, uh, these struggles cause them to feel kind of disappointed in themselves and it, they start doubting themselves. I met multiple students who said, uh, no matter how much I try, I cannot get it done. No matter, no matter how I try, my handwriting does not get better. So as um, they are new in here and um, their education system back in their homes in here are completely different. However, right now they are exposed to multiple subjects, not only English, but other subjects as well. And they are learning new material that they did not know initially in their own language. And some of them even are not literate in their own languages, which I am sure puts a lot of pressure on them. And this pressure, uh, it is depressing and disappointing for them. Um, also, uh, during my interviews with the students, I asked, uh, whether they liked school more in here or they prefer to go to school back in their home countries. Most of them said that they liked the school back in there because they had more friends, they could communicate better and that school was fun for them. However, only one of them said that he liked school more here because it was safer for him and it offered better quality. Uh, about the teachers, uh, so uh, first of all, I noticed that the teacher was quite overwhelmed with the population in her class. She had more than 30 students. And indeed, it is hard for them, it's hard for the teacher to deliver high quality education uh, to the students who come from diverse backgrounds with diverse learning styles. And um, another problem that I noticed in the class was that it is a, a multi-grade class in which six, seven, and eighth graders all study together. Um, so the teacher uh, sometimes asked the school uh, for providing another teacher so that they can uh, divide the class in half and um, try to work more one-on-one -on -one and try to offer subjects and um, concepts that uh, were appropriate for those classes. Because they're multi-grade classes, it is really hard to find, uh, sub find topics that are interesting, engaging for all of them at once. Because the understanding level of a sixth grader and eighth grader, they completely differ. However, the school most of the time said that they had problem with budget and they could not hire another teacher. So that is one of the problems that the teachers face. And um, about the students, um, because of their language barrier, they usually do not have access to the resources that um, are already there. For example, they cannot go to the counseling office and ask them for help, or even go to the nurse's office and ask for help, or even go to the library and try to find books that they like themselves. They cannot communicate that. However, the teacher tries her best to help them out with all of those. Uh, as a part of the conclusion for my paper, uh, and for my paper, um, when I started to put all my observations together uh, to make uh, the paper more interesting, I wanted to start with a story. Uh, the story of a girl named Aisha who was um, in elementary school or middle school. And um, she had all her friends, families with her. She was doing well at school. However, one day, um, 
migrated to, the, um, to another country, I reflected upon her story, uh, her story and how and what challenges she was facing. Um, the conclusion of my paper, I would like to read it to you because I think that is more comprehensive. And um, I read the conclusion in two parts. One is the conclusion of my observation. And the final part of it is uh, about um, my reaction and my response to it. So it says, uh, in conclusion, I was reassured that settling down in a completely diverse country can be frustrating, not only because there is so much to adapt with and learn, but also because you need to start from the scratch and earn everything you had once earned in your own country. You will have to make new friends, search for new resources, and come up with new solutions for new challenges. The same condition applies to immigrants' children as immigrant adults. They face difficulties with the language, with the system, with the resources. Similarly, teachers struggle to deliver high quality education. Schools do not have enough resources to confront all that students need, and usually budget is a huge barrier. I agree that most schools are only the only resources left for students, and yet they have a lot of problems fitting into the school and having the courage to ask for help and what they need. I recommend that the government provides more budget to school districts so they can hire more teachers and have a reasonable number of students in a class where they can study one-to-one. -one. And this part is about my own reaction and feelings. I feel that immigration is not only a political phenomenon because it is not a matter of borders over a piece of land, but it is concerned with lives, of, with lives within human society. Thus, dealing with immigrants does not remain only responsibility for the government but each of us has a part to play as human beings. We are all responsible to make Aisha's life feel safe and welcomed. I chose to play my part by working on Afghan Empowerment Counseling Program, where whose mission is to provide Afghan students the mentorship and social support required to successfully navigate through their academic journeys and higher education. These include assessing and FAFSA applications, transfer applications, and career path search and opportunities. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm sorry for that. And um, you can play your part by funding and donating to scholarship programs, providing basic needs, assisting in transportation, and many other ways. In the world of humans, even, even a smile counts. So this concludes my paper and um, I learned a lot from it and I hope you have also learned something from it. Um, I would let Ms. Wendy take over the floor. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Husna. Thank you, everyone. This is gold. I really appreciate your being here tonight to talk about your work and, and to share it with each other. Uh, and the group here. Does anyone, uh, any one of the participants or audience have questions for any of the students or maybe some comments? You can uh, go ahead and speak up or you can um, write a, a question or comment in the chat. Well, not surprisingly, I have a few questions. I'll start with Jose since you went first. You there, Jose? Yes, I am. Okay. Can you tell me um, the most important example of social capital that you found? Okay. Well, actually, actually, it went directly with me because the, this research when I when I moved to San Marcos, um, which is really close to Escondido, they're just neighbors, right? They're just neighbor cities. Um, the only person that I knew here in, in the North County was pretty much my brother-in-law. So when I decided to do the, the research paper, I, I was 
between um, the pickup, the late night pickup soccer games that I know that he that he they always go to, and then he's invited me before, and, or um, and then uh, a, a store where they elaborate to my list, but that didn't happen because I I like soccer better. So the 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 social capital social capital i think i personally experienced it because after absorbing them and then actually staying later and talking with them and listening to them and absorbing when they when they invited me to one of one of their birthday parties and recently um with one of the one of the one of their friends which is now my friend his name his name is juve or his we call him juve and he's a mechanic and I have two things. Uh, I have a thing. Uh, yes, two two children like I do, and one of his one of his uh, children has autism. Like my like I have an, a younger son. He is uh, uh, he just turned five. He he has autism. So when doing this research paper, I talked. I came to talk with him, and then um, after talking with him, his his wife and my wife became good friends because they they're they're both um uh, i mean we we as dads too but they they both connected because she she knows the school system that that her son who has autism she knows the school system a little bit better because she's been here in the north county for a while so that's an example of social capital it's something that not knowing or a new city not knowing how the education system or how the school system works here and in the North County, uh, who do I talk to? Who do I ask? It's 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 not as easy as you think. You can read reviews, but reviews is one thing. But when you hear from someone that that you know and that you can trust, like a friend, then it, then it's a, a worth a lot more. And another example too, and and I'll stick with him with Juve. Uh, my dad's car actually broke down not too long ago, and I and I remember, so, oh, dad, like I know a mechanic like uh maybe he can help you out and he he helped them fix the car and then and and that's that's another example of of, of social capital that that i not realizing it it comes from just a pickup game you you break the ice having fun with each other playing soccer mm -hmm. and it's in and, and, and it's it starts playful and but when you have those conversations you you come to find out or you work you work here you work over there or you can do this you can do that and you don't do it to take advantage no you you do it to help each other each other out because they they all offer help to each other so whenever someone needs something it's like hey just ask who he's the mechanic or ask uh johnny he's the he's the he's the plumber or I have problem with some some of my electric my electrical work at my house. I'll 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 talk to Atlai and and that's how it works. You, they all help each other. They all have blue collar work and they help each other to in their everyday life. And then that. Thank you. Oh, sorry. No, it's all right. We go ahead and finish your sentence. Oh yeah, just at the end, just and then it leads into even personal things like um get go, going to each other's birthday parties and getting to know each other's families so i think that's what, what i what i call social capital and like the social time thanks jose right. looks like we had a question in the chat from my excellent colleague pega motala uh what have you learned about yourself as a writer as a result of this ethnographic research and it looks like stephanie answered it in the chat the more time I give myself, the better my paper can be. Re rewriting helped my paper. Um, I was wondering if uh, Shauna or Husna wanted to answer that question as well. Sure, um, something happened right there. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, it definitely showed me that I have a lot more potential than I, <laughs> than I realized, especially because it's been a long time since I've written that much. Um, but I mean, the strategy that I ended up having to come up with was just, it was like, I never even thought about doing this until I had so much to work with. And I, I just, I was writing and writing. And then I was like, what am I doing with all this? Nothing's transitioning, nothing goes together. The, I have no direction. So I ended up just printing it out and just cutting up all of the paragraphs 
separately and I like sat on the floor and I just had all the paragraphs laid around me with my computer in the middle and I started labeling all the different paragraphs what they related to and then I put those together and those together and then like one section you know I'll have that five little pieces of paper together and I'll just start going through them and blending them together and that helped me organize if I needed it like out there I couldn't do it on a computer anymore I needed something like laid out in front of me something tangible and something visual and I mean now that I know that I can do that it's I I'm, I'm definitely going to hold on to that but it's just like stuff like that and like other little things that I you know use as strategy to create that I'm like proud of it <laughs> thanks Shauna that's amazing um Actually, there are famous writers who did that, especially before the invention of the computer. I, I studied a writer who would um, uh, either write or type her stuff out and put it all over the floor and sometimes like pin it with straight pins, like cut up paragraphs and stuff and move them around and pin them together until they made a long piece. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, who's the one about you? Um, first of all, that was really interesting, Shona. I think I will try that next time. And um, about my paper, I also had quite the same problem. Although I knew I had all the information, but it was a struggle for me to put it all together. And especially because I had some external researchers too that were not my observations. Um, I researched about those. And I was wondering, do I use them to back up my own arguments or do I just refer that there are other people who have had similar observations. It was challenging in the in, in the beginning, and um, I am a person who procrastinates a little bit. So because it was a little challenging, I kind of procrastinated the paper. And um, unfortunately, in the middle of it, some other things also came up that I had to uh, tackle with. Um, but eventually, um, I had to start. And I think taking the first step really matters because um, once I started writing, so with the introduction, I had came up with that earlier, but then uh, when I actually started to put up my own observations, uh, once I started, the paper tried to build up, like started to build up itself and uh, point after point, um, they started to connect and eventually the paper was made. Thank you. Um, Shauna, you posted a, oh, there it is. <laughs> Thanks for that. I love that. Can I save that to show students in the future? Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I know that was interesting. I laid it out I'm like, and I, I, I took it to send to my friend. I'm like, I told you I wasn't kidding. <laughs> I have a lot to do. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's great. I think that, I think that it's hard to organize your own stuff and, and the way you want to put it together, but it's, I think it's really vital and it's a form of critical thinking too. Like, how's this going to work best? You know, I think I, I could have said, you know, in your first paragraph, do this and your second one, do this, but I, I kind of left you to your own devices. And I, I know that's frustrating for a lot of people. And sometimes I wonder if I should even do that, but um, I love your stories about it. It seems like it worked out well. It cut out all the noise, basically. I think that's what it really came down to. Yeah, yeah, cut out the noise. You're right. Um, Husna, you got a question that was specifically for you um, from Liz Flynn. Hi, Husna, how did you get into volunteering so quickly after arriving in the US? I think that would be tough to know what opportunities are available and how to connect. Um, actually, that was a problem. So um, after the fall of my country last year in August, uh, we left home really in a bad situation like we had to pack up everything just in a backpack and leave so when we came here to the u.s first we settled in a refugee camp where we left for 40 for almost two months and um actually i started volunteering in there because um there it was only a refugee camp and uh, they had a lot of trouble in the clinic and especially in communication because um it, it like is English speakers are rare in Afghanistan and people really had trouble expressing themselves and their problems to the doctors. So I went and volunteered in the clinic. And um, after that, I learned that I could do a job as a translator. 
And uh, when we came here to, the, to San Diego, um, almost three months after our arrival, uh, when we were enrolling my siblings in school, I talked to their principal and I asked them if they had any tutors or anyone who could help these students because my siblings were not the only newcomers. There were um, like tens or hundreds of other newcomers that came and especially um, in El Cajon uh, where we live, uh, it as a refugee town, I would say. So from there on, um, I connected to them and I had a conversation with another person of them, another one in there. And he said that uh, there might be job applications for um, assistance. And then I took their websites and I went there and I looked it up and uh, turned out that I could work there. So I pulled up my resume, I applied and I got the job. Congratulations. That is Thank you. wonderful that you were able to do that. Thank you so much. Well, I'm sorry to say it, but we are out of time. I want to thank everyone for coming and especially thank you to these brave and dedicated scholars who shared their time with us. Happy holidays to all. Thank, thank you. you. Happy holidays to you and everyone thank else. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Good night, everyone.